As we move into chapter 5 today, Paul offers one more lengthy warning to the Galatians about abandoning the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for months we have been considering Paul's arguments, his warnings in his letter to the Galatians. We've talked about his trips to Jerusalem, his defending his gospel that he preached to them. Uh, We've talked a lot about Abraham. We've talked about curses and a whole host of other things. And to recap... The circumstances, after Paul and Barnabas made their initial missionary trip to the Galatia region and established these particular churches, we're talking about what is modern day Turkey, that particular region. So after they had left, false teachers came into those churches and they began to claim that you need Jesus plus circumcision. Or you need Jesus Plus, you need to follow the dietary restrictions that are found in the law. Or you need Jesus, plus you have to observe the religious holidays as set forth in the law. Jesus, plus your own performance in keeping the law. In essence, the false teachers came in and they were saying this, Jesus is not enough. Grace is not enough enough. You need to work. You need the law. And so Paul writes this letter in an attempt to set their wavering theology straight. And he says, this is another gospel that they're preaching to you. And in fact, it is not a gospel at all. There is nothing good newsy about what they're telling you and what they are teaching you. Because the gospel is this. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's Christ alone who saves. Hopefully you were able to watch this week a short video that we put out. I explained in that video chapter 4 verse 21 where we left off last week through 5-1, a section that we're not going to cover on a Sunday morning. If you did miss that, it's about six minutes. You can catch that on our YouTube channel. It'll at least bridge the gap because today we're going to start in chapter 5 and verse 1. If you would follow along as I read aloud, It says this, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, Paul says, listen, behold, I, Paul, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For it is through the Spirit by faith that we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running so well. Who has hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, then why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Father, we come before you today in need. We are but bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. And we need your spirit to sure us up. We need your spirit to breathe life as Psalm 104 so beautifully spoke to us this morning. Give us 
life today. Give life to your word today. Help us to be hearers of the word today. Help us to be doers of the word today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 supplies for us a transition from, again, what's in the short video to where we are moving forward from. Just last week, we covered the first imperative command that Paul gives in the whole letter. Think of that. We were in chapter 4 before Paul gives one of his commands of instruction, and you may remember it as this. He said, become as I am. Lay aside the law. Put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. Become as I am. Well, today we find our second piece of instruction. Don't worry. There is more coming in the coming weeks. But here's what he says. Stand firm. Stand firm and do not submit yourselves again to the yoke, the shackles, the bondage of slavery. It's important that we see that, that Paul has laid this theological foundation uh, and groundwork all throughout the letter. For four chapters, he has been building this argument and this theology that we are free in Christ. There's freedom in him. Which he summarizes in verse 1 where he says this, For freedom, Christ has set us free. This is what we call an indicative a fact. Paul lays it out. He's made the argument and he says, now, here's the fact. For freedom, Christ has set you free. But Paul never leaves an indicative without following it up with an imperative, with a command, with something that is meant to be done as a result of that truth. And what is the something that's to be done? What is the imperative? Stand firm now in your freedom. We're to stand firm. What does that mean? It means to plant your feet firmly on the good news of Jesus. To plant your feet firmly on the news of His substitutionary death. Of His glorious, life-giving resurrection. So that when the hurricane force winds of false teaching come your way and try to wreck your faith, you will not move because your feet are planted firmly in the truth of the gospel. When the rains come and the floods begin to rise, the floods of circumstances and tragedy, you will not be moved away from Jesus because you are planted firmly in the good news. This tells me something. It tells me that we, were, we are to always be preaching the gospel to ourselves. That we never move beyond this truth that we must, with consistency in our lives, be digging deeper into these truths, into God's Word, so that we have greater understanding. Because trials will continue to come. False teachers aren't going away anytime soon. And so the deeper we can dig, the firmer we will stand as we move through those seasons of life. And so Paul opens with stand firm in your freedom. Don't put on those shackles of slavery again. Now let's consider Paul's arguments. The first is this. He says Christ is greater than circumcision. In verses 2, 3, and 4, he lays out a series of, of quick warnings for the Galatians to consider. First, he says this, if you accept circumcision, that is, you think that this surgical procedure that is performed is something that will justify you, make you holy before God, make your relationship right, if you believe that to be true, which is the teaching that they were enduring in the Galatian region, he says then this, Christ is of no advantage to you. If that's what you believe, then Christ is of no advantage. You might as well get up and walk out right now because the gospel is of no advantage. If you accept circumcision as a means of justification, then he says you are obligated now to keep the entirety of the law. All of the ceremony, all of the holidays, no more shrimp for you. The dietary restrictions apply. 
You have to keep the entirety of the law if you're going to accept that it's by circumcision. If you accept circumcision, he says this, you are severed from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. You see, as we've said over and over again, the law and obedience to the law cannot justify us. Why? Because we can't obey it. We can't keep it. We're incapable of doing that. There is only one who has obeyed. There's only one who has fulfilled the law. His name is Jesus, and he did so on our behalf. He did what we could not do. And so to say that that my circumcision, my law-keeping justifies me, makes me holy before God, diminishes the life's work of Jesus. His death, His resurrection, it's arrogant. It's prideful. It's damnable for us to consider that it's us in any way and not Him. I, I, don't, I don't care if you're here and you say, well, I'll give Jesus the, the 90% and I get the 10. It's arrogant. It's 100% Christ. Zero percent me. It's all his work that brings about justification. The gospel of Jesus teaches that we're justified by faith, and that's what Paul reminds us of in verses 5 and 6. Notice those again. He says this, for through the Spirit. This is just beautiful, beautiful language that he uses. Through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith that is working through love. Though we have been declared righteous because we have, by the Spirit's work in us, put our faith in Jesus, the the Father seeing me as holy, you don't see me as holy. My family certainly doesn't see me as holy and blameless. But I and you are eagerly, hopefully, waiting for the fulfillment of all righteousness. I'm justified because of Christ, but in in the process of sanctification, I've still got a long way to go. You've still got a long way to go. But we don't don't approach our sanctification as, oh man, I don't think this is ever going to happen. We approach it with hope, knowing that what God has started, He will finish in our lives the full application of righteousness will one day come and we anticipate that day when we will be made whole when the as we sang the wedding bells ring and we the bride in full purity no spots as Paul writes in Ephesians no wrinkles We celebrate our marriage with the Savior. And then, in a true, just mic drop kind of a moment, Paul declares this. I love this verse, verse six. Circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. It's all about faith in Jesus. And notice what he says, because this is gonna be very important from where we move forward today into next week and the following weeks. Because what does he say there in verse 6? I want you to see it in your own copy of Scripture. Because he says this faith, this faith is proved to be genuine by what? Love. By love. Love proves the genuineness of our justification. And uh, I don't want to preach that whole sermon yet. We're going to get there in a few sermons that are upcoming, but I want you to see that. But but he says this is not about circumcision. It's not about uncircumcision. Stop talking about circumcision and start talking about Christ is what Paul is telling these churches. And as I typed those words out earlier in the week, it made me start thinking, what are all the things we talk about? What are all the issues that we talk about in the church Often, instead of talking about Christ, sometimes it's attendance numbers. 
We're, we're, we're so engrossed with, well, here's how many people are there. Here's, here's what's going on in, in this ministry. Are we talking about specifics of ministries or, or Bible versions sometimes, music selection sometimes, politics, buildings, all sorts of things. Now, I'm not saying these things are not things that we need to talk about because, yeah, there's times we need to talk about them. But none of them are more important than Christ. None of them matter more than Christ. And in the end, none of them really matter. They're trellises that are meant to help vines grow. And we're focused on the vine work. Second point he makes is this. Christ is greater than false teachers. Back in my running days, I had a few nasty wipeouts uh, running down the streets of Republic. And it's always funny, if you've, if you've ever run and you've had a wipeout, it doesn't matter how much pain your body is in, the very first thing you do is you look up and make sure nobody saw you. Uh, because that, that, that pride being hurt is worse than anything you're feeling at that, that point. But oddly enough, it was never anything big that made me fall. Uh, though cars would pull out in front of me, it was never a car that made me tumble over. It was never a, a misplaced trash can that I didn't see. It was always like a, a quarter or a half inch lift in the sidewalk. I just didn't notice it, and my feet certainly didn't notice it, and, and it would send me just tumbling into the middle of the street. As we move into verse 7, Paul shows his passionate disdain for the false teachers. He writes, you Galatians, you were running so well. Who is it that has tripped you? What is the half inch lift that has caused you now to stumble so far away from Christ? Paul is sure, and he reminds the Galatians that, that this is not of Christ. This is not the doing of the one who has called you to himself. Understand that. Oh, to be called to Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful phrase? Rather, he says, it's someone in your churches who has added a little bit of leaven to the lump. And oh, just a little bit of that leaven, a little bit of that yeast, what's going to make that bread expand? Just a, just a little bit. It doesn't take much sin to ruin and spoil a church. It doesn't take much false teaching to sever a person from Christ. That's the point he makes. Just a small crack has sent them tumbling away. But Paul is still confident. I love this. I mean, we've spent four chapters, even at one point where he said, I wonder if I've labored in vain over you. But he's still confident and hopeful that God is not done with his people and that the Galatians will once again embrace Christ and Christ alone. And he's also confident that the troubler, whoever this is, he says, this leavener, this tripper, will face judgment. You know, Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 18. And he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, whoever causes them to stumble, whoever causes them to trip, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how passionate Christ is for his sheep. Teachers, be warned. We must be warned, not just here, but in so many places in the scriptures. Verse 11 seems to come out of nowhere to us and tends to confuse us. I'm not, uh, I'm sure that 2,000 years ago when the Galatians read it, they knew immediately what Paul was addressing at this point, but it's a bit confusing and leaves us scratching our heads. Let's, let's just read it real quick. He says, but if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. The, the best understanding, at least in my opinion, is, is when it comes to his own views on circumcision is what they're, they're addressing. Because Paul 
He didn't seem to mind when ethnic Jews were circumcised. He wasn't berating them. Timothy was circumcised. And so Paul didn't say you, you should never be circumcised. His point is that circumcision does not save you. Culturally, it may be something you want to continue to do, and that's okay. But they were using his words against him. They were using his own practices against him and saying, Paul, you still, you still allow for circumcision. And Paul is arguing back at them as if to say, if I preach that one can be justified by circumcision, then why am I still persecuted? What are we arguing about, he says. No, we're not saying the same thing because the false teacher is saying, see, Paul is saying the same thing that we're saying. And Paul says, I'm not saying the same thing you're saying. Bringing the section to a close, Paul offers what I believe to be the most pointed and graphic line in all of his letters. You take everything Paul writes and you know how pointed he can be. But right here he says this, I wish those who unsettle you, those who trip you, those who are leading you astray would emasculate themselves. Remember, we're talking about circumcision. Paul wishes they would go the whole way with the knife and emasculate themselves completely. It might be that Paul has in mind the idea that they can't have any kids that will continue to propagate what they're teaching. We don't know. But his sentiment sounds to us, this is John Stott writing. It sounds to our ears both coarse and malicious. We may be quite sure, however, that it was due neither to an intemperate spirit nor to a thirst for revenge, but it was due to his deep love for the people of God and the gospel of God. I venture to say that if we were as concerned about God's church and God's word as Paul was, we too would wish that false teachers might cease from the land. Paul, like Jesus, like Yahweh, is jealous for his people. I've been here myself. Some of you have been there too. I've sat across the table from people that I loved, opened up God's word and begged them to follow in obedience. But there were other voices in their life. There was friends, there was family, there was pastors who were saying something contrary to Scripture. And in those moments, there was an anger in me. I just wish they would shut up. I just wish God would remove them from this person's life because they're standing between them and Christ. So as we bring this section to a close, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, the most important, is your faith in Jesus' performance, His life, His death, His resurrection, or is it in yours? The good things you did this week. They outweighed my bad. I'm doing okay. Is it in your performance that you came here today? You're here. I, I showed up. God must be happy with me. Or is it in the work of Christ? Have you come to Jesus empty-handed, confessing your need for him and him alone to save you? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. It is not of works, lest you could boast. We don't come here today boasting. I made it to church today, read my Bible today. We come here every Sunday boasting in Christ and in Christ alone because if he did not come, if he did not save, we would not be here at all. We would have no hope at all. 
Friends, today is the day to come to Jesus, to confess to Him your sin, to confess to Him your need for forgiveness, to confess to Him your need for His righteousness, because yours just isn't going to cut it. Christian, are you standing firm in your freedom, in the freedom that Christ has offered you? Are you trying to, to turn back to the slavery of the law, to your performance? There is a, there is a constant pull in us to, to perform and to attempt to outperform Christ. That is a constant temptation we have because at our core, we are pride-filled people, arrogant people, selfish people. And there's a constant tendency in our fleshly nature to say, ah, you can be good enough or you can do this on your own. Are you trying to turn back to the slavery of sin? Again, I think this is the one we recognize the most. We're always in danger here. We're always in danger of, of moving back to sin and putting on that yoke of sin again and being the angry person that we once were, but Christ gave us freedom, but we feel the pull back to be bitter, to be angry, to worry, to lust. Scripture says don't do it. Don't go back. Stand firm in the freedom that Christ's death and life have purchased for you. Don't go back, Paul says. We have to always strive to dig deeper into our understanding of the gospel so that when those winds come, we can withstand. When the floods come in our lives, what commitments do you need to make so that you today can begin to dig deeper into the gospel? Maybe it's just getting into God's word again with some regularity. You're, you're, not, you're not intaking truth. You're intaking what you're hearing on the radio, what you're reading online, and you're not giving God's word an opportunity to take root in your life. Maybe it's coming out on Wednesday nights. If that's an opportunity that you have in your schedule, it's free to come and just, again, pray. Look at God's Word. Maybe it's just making a commitment to read a book this fall that's going to point you to Christ and help you dig deeper into your understanding of Him. And on this point, I'll also say this. We have to protect this church. It's our responsibility to protect this church. To, we, we have been, here's the words that are used, we have been entrusted with the gospel. This church is meant to be a pillar and a ground of the truth that displays God's word, the truth of Christ clearly in this community and around the world. A little leaven can up in this whole thing. Paul told Timothy, watch your doctrine. We have to be ready, we have to be alert to, to sense it and, and remove it, to cut it out at any point. It would present itself in our congregation. And finally today, let's give Christ praise for what he has done. As was read in Psalm 104, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let's give praise where praise is due today to Jesus Christ, who saves completely.